Hi, I'm Dan. I'll be showing you a walkthrough on a Jayco Whitehawk. Uh, this walkthrough can also be used on Jay Feathers as well. There's a lot of similarities between components and appliances, stuff like that. Um, so we'll start up front, get everything up here, do a little walk around, I'll explain things as we go. If you ever have questions about anything, feel free to contact us later, either by email or give us a call. Um, on this particular model, you will have uh, the BAL uh, stabilizing system. Uh, to electronically lower your stabilizer jacks. This is just for stabilization. It is not for leveling. So you want to make sure to get the unit as level as possible first, either by driving up on some blocks, uh, leveling blocks, and then you just use your uh, tongue jack to level it front to back. Once it's level, you can drop all your stabilizer jacks. This does have a lock, so nobody can mess with your controls when you have it off. You do have a power button. You tap to turn it on. Once it is on, you have the controls for retract and extend and which ones you want to be doing. You do have the option for all stab jacks. I only recommend doing that one when you're retracting all of them just to make it quicker. Um, but as you're going down, if you're on unlevel terrain, you will only want to be doing one at a time. Um, so right now, I'll show you the tongue jack. You want to hold down, either extend or retract, and then hit the button. So to retract it, hold that down and tap to retract either raise or lower the front end. Once you get it level, then you can drop your stabilizer jacks. And we could do the left front one. And again, you just wanna hold it down until it hits the ground and add some pressure to it, uh, just to stop from shaking around. This is all this is for. Um, you don't wanna overextend it. You actually will most likely blow a fuse um, by putting too much pressure on there. Uh, if they extend too far, it can blow the fuse as well, so you want to make sure to add some extra blocks underneath just to stop them from going too far. Um, and to retract them, just hold it until they come to a stop. And that's all you have to do. Um, if for some reason you lose all power, or maybe the motor's dead on one of them, you can uh, individually, manually operate each one. For the front ton jack, you remove this rubber piece here. And if you just use a half inch ratchet end in there or with an extension, you'll be able to ratchet it up and down. For each of your individual stabilizer jacks, you will have a manual crank. It's got a three quarter inch end, it just attaches here to be able to run it up and down. You can attach a three quarter inch socket on a drill to be able to run it. But you definitely want to make sure to keep this wrench in case of an emergency. Uh, your propane system. All the propane containers are going to come with an automatic switch regulator. Um, depends on what came with the unit. You might have 30 pound cylinders, you might have 20. These are the 30 pounds. Um, and they will be filled up, so they will have 30 pounds each. So right now, filled up, they would have 60 pounds of propane. On the regulator, you're going to have an indicator. Uh, right now it is red to let you know there's no pressure coming to the system. When you open up one of the containers, once pressure builds up, that indicator will disappear and just go to clear, to let you know you have pressure. And this is your indicator switch. Right now there's an arrow on there, it's pointed to the left, now it's pointed to the right. Whatever side that's pointed to, it's going to point to your primary tank. It'll mainly draw from that side. Once that side gets empty, it'll automatically switch to draw from the other side, as long as this is open. When that happens, this will go back to red to let you know there's no pressure coming from that side. Um, but everything will still be operating. When that does happen, just flip it towards the other side. Uh, close this, take it off, go get it filled. In the meantime, you can still use this one, even with this one disconnected. Um, so you're not shutting off your stove top, your water heater or anything. Uh, and I, Once you get the other one filled, hook it back up, open it back up, let it drain from this side, and then it'll automatically switch to the other side. This is going to be your battery. It's a 12 volt deep cycle battery. Uh, they aren't maintenance free, so you do want to check the water levels on it from time to time. Just a few times a year is fine. Uh, just by popping up these caps, you'll see three holes. If the water levels ever look low, just add distilled water, never add tap water. Um, in this unit, you're only going to have two connections uh, one red being your positive, one black being your negative. Uh, some units might have uh, two red ones, uh, most of the time, they only have one negative. 
Uh, a lot of them on the frames as well can be set up for an additional battery. And you will have uh, a box and a cover for this as well. On every camp you're going to have a first line of defense going in. Uh, there's going to be some sort of fuse. Uh, and this one it does have a resettable fuse um, to where if it draws too much amperage it will trip. Um, once it does trip, as long as the problem is resolved, it will automatically reset. Some other units do have uh, blade fuse, a 30 amp blade fuse up front. Uh, if those do blow, you have to replace them. This one will automatically reset. But if you ever have issues with battery power going back to the RV, this is the first thing you want to check. On many units, nowadays they are coming prepped for uh, solar power. Uh, you'll have a connection a lot of times up near the frame, sometimes inside a compartment. Um, all it is just a quick connect to be able to hook up a solar panel. Um, a lot of people use them to recharge the batteries during storage. Or if you do a lot of dry camping, you can actually get one rated up to 20 amps to be able to fully recharge your battery throughout the day. Um, so you can take long trips running solely off your battery. But they are coming prepped with that. This is your breakaway switch. This is just a safety device. Uh, it'll be attached to your vehicle during travel. And for some reason, the trailer becomes disconnected from the vehicle. This cord will pull and this will pop out of the box. When that happens, the trailer will come to a stop. Um, instead of just barreling down the road. Um, this is just a safety device. Do not use this as a parking brake. Uh, that'll actually damage the box and it'll actually damage your brakes as well. Um, there's a little safety tag on there. Do not leave out for more than 20 minutes. So it is okay to pop it out if you need to connect it to your vehicle and pop it back in. Uh, just don't leave it out because it will damage the system. This is just a safety device. On this particular unit, it is equipped with a battery disconnect switch. This isn't found on all trailers. Um, but mainly the White Hawks do have them. Some J Feathers will have them as well. All it does is just disconnects your battery from the system during storage. Um, whenever you are using it or traveling, you do want to make sure that the switch is in the on position so the battery gets a charge. But whenever you're done camping, just flip it to the off position and you know the next time you go out for a trip, you'll have a good full charge battery. Now you're going to have two sources of water that are available for use. The city water connection and the fresh, fresh water uh, fill connection. Uh, city water connection is if you're using water pressure from the campground. Uh, typically if they have full hookup they'll have a water connection. Uh, when you have a water hose connected there, as soon as you turn on the faucet everything inside is pressurized. You don't have to turn anything else on. Um, you do have the option to fill your fresh water tank. Like if you want to fill it at home or fill it up at the campground if you don't have a full hookup. Um, and the sizes vary. Usually from like 20 to 40 gallons. Uh, so make sure to check your owner's manual and see what size you have. But well, with the fresh water fill, uh, you'll fill it up with water, and if you want to use that water, you do have to turn the water pump on inside to be able to suck from it to go to the system. Where this, you're working off the pressure. You don't have to worry about turning on the water pump. Uh, whenever you're done, as soon as you turn off the water pressure here, you're good to go. But if you're done with your fresh fill tank, you will have to open up the drain to be able to empty out the tank whenever you're done. Uh, you do have an outside shower. Most of them are coming equipped with this today. Uh, they just have a key to lock it in place. This is your sewer termination valve for your tanks. Um, this particular unit only has one gray tank and one black tank. Sometimes you might have two gray tanks, um, even two black tanks, or maybe even two of each. And you could have separate terminations as well. Um, but this is just the main point for the sewer to be able to dump out. Your gray tank will be your sinks in your shower. Black tank is going to be only your toilet tank. Uh, so if you have an RV that has two toilets, you will have two black tanks. Um, the sewer hose, connect the same way this cap does. Attach it to here, put it down on the sewer. You want to open up the black tank first, get all the contents of that out. Once that's draining, close it up, open up the gray tank. It's going to be more soapy water, kind of rinses the termination out, rinses out the hose. Um, but you want to make sure to do one at a time so they're not battling back and forth and you don't want any of the contents of the black tank to get up into the gray. Whenever you are done emptying them, make sure to close the valves back up because you might still have some contents sitting at the bottom of the tank. Um, and you put that cap back on, you travel, the next time you get to your destination you take that off you might have some contents coming back out at you. Uh, if you're at a campground that has a sewer at the site, you can leave the sewer hose connected into the sewer, but you don't want to leave your valves open. If you just let this valve open, what will happen 
are the liquids will run out, but the solids will build up on the inside and will get the pyramid effect. And you'll have a lot of plumbing issues. So you want to make sure to leave them closed until it's ready time uh, to flush it out. Uh, the grade's not as important. As long as you're not rinsing off any food and stuff in the sinks, you're just kind of washing your hands, maybe taking a shower. That one you can leave open. That is fine. Uh, but the black one is very important to leave closed until it is full. And you do want to make sure to use your black tank chemicals. Uh, they're chemical additives you put down in the toilet just to help break down and digest everything. Um, and then there's all different kinds. There's eco-friendly ones, uh, heavier digesters, you know, for all your needs. But when you do flush out your black tank, the chemical flushes out as well. So the next time you go to use it, you will have to add more chemical. And during travel, always make sure your cap is back in place. So nobody's thinking you're dumping down the road. Some RVs now are coming equipped with a black tank flush. Um, most of the Whitehawks do have them. Some Jay Feathers have them. Uh, what this is is just a little nozzle attached to the side of your black tank, where you can actually take your hose here and attach it here. And there is a check valve on there, so you don't have to worry about cross contamination coming back. When you turn on the water pressure here. There's spindle inside the black tank just shoots a water jet along the sidewalls to help flush everything out. When you do use that, you have to make sure that your black tank valve is open and the contents are drained out. Once they're drained out, you attach this. And it's kind of help rinses everything out, push out extra contents. Let it run, you know, maybe two or three minutes just to help clean everything out. You don't have to use this, uh, but I highly recommend it just to help keep everything nice and clean. Um, whenever you're uh, you are done just make sure to close the valve but as you're using this it's very very important to have this valve open because if this valve is closed and you're using this you're just filling up your black tank uh, so always make sure the valve is open while using it so this is actually going to be the uh, fill tank for your fresh tank uh, so if you want to take your own water with you uh, you can use this uh, this doesn't have a connection to attach the hose the hose just rests in the place and it's gravity fill so as you're filling it uh, it does have an overflow hose underneath to where water will start chewing out once it's full. We do have an indicator inside to be able to tell you how full it is. And again, to use this, you do have to turn on the water pump to suck the water into the system to be able to pressurize everything. Um, the reason they give you a gravity fill too is say you're really camping out in the wilderness uh, and you're by a stream, you want to fill it with a bucket and funnel. You can do that. Um, you just want to be careful with contents, any kind of debris sand, stuff like that. You want to make sure it's not getting inside, so it's not a bad idea to add a filter to just stream water when going inside. Now these two right here are your low point drains for your water lines. Uh, lately they've been indicating them by red for your hot line and blue for your cold line. What these are is just your water lines meet at one low spot. And if you want to drain out as much water as possible in the lines, open these up and go inside and open up all your faucets to allow air into the system and it'll clear out most of the water. Um, really the only time you need to use these is when you're winterizing um, just to get out as much water as possible before adding antifreeze or see let it sit with water for a long time and it's real stagnant just kind of smells you can open these up clear out your water lines and get fresh water into the system these are located at different points on every single camper um, Jacob is good about indicating the location with a sticker on the outside wall uh, it just says low point drain um, so it's always a good idea to make sure to Find yours, see where they're located, um, in case you ever need to use them. This is where your power cord is going to attach to. Most of them these days are coming with detachable cords. Um, they do have 30 amp and 50 amp rated systems. This one is a 30 amp. You can always tell one just has the three connections on it. Um, but to attach a detachable cord, it can only go on one way. You, know, you can't accidentally put it on an upside down. They do that on purpose. You actually attach it into place and turn it just a little bit clockwise. It locks into place. And you have a, a weather guard you want to tighten down. Makes the connection nice and secure, but also keeps water from getting in if it does rain. Um, 30 amp connections. Like I said before, it does have a three prong. It's going to be your most common you'll find at campgrounds. Um, they do make adapters uh, to attach to these to be able to plug it into your house. Uh, if you do do that, just be careful because most household outlets are only rated for 15 to 20 amps. Uh, where this is a 30 amp system. You don't want to be running everything inside, uh, especially all at the same time. Most likely we'll trip the breaker. The most common things that trip the breaker would be the air conditioner and the microwave. Um, this is going to be your most common outlet at campgrounds. If you have a 50 amp system, 
you want to make sure to check before you go to see what the campsite has. Uh, if they don't have 50, you can use the 30 um, using a dog bone adapter. Um, but again, whenever you drop it down to a lower amp rating, you do want to be careful utilizing everything inside. This unit does come equipped with the backup camera installed. Um, even if you don't have the backup camera, most of them are coming equipped with it prepped. You will just see an empty black box hanging up on top there. Um, what that means, if you have that, is that it is pre-wired for everything. All you have to do is just remove the cover, plug in the camera, and reinstall the cover. Uh, and Typically, you have to pair the camera to the system. The instructions will be in the owner's manual for that as well. Um, the most important thing about these backup cameras is the power source comes off of your running lights on the top up there. So you do have to have your running lights on during travel for your backup camera to work. Uh, they don't kick on from the reverse light of the vehicle. Uh, they only kick on if your running lights are off. Most vehicles today have the automatic setting where they turn on at night. So if you want to use your camera during the day, make sure to have your running lights on for power. A lot of RVs today are coming equipped with outside kitchens. I uh, just want to point out a few things out here. Uh, if you have one of these small little refrigerators, um, these only work off of 120 volt being plugged into an outlet. They will not work off of your battery. Um, the standard RV fridge inside will work off your battery and propane to operate. These small little guys only work if you're plugged into an outlet. Uh, you do get a lot of accessories out here. You have a couple outlets. Um, your sink does have an adapter to attach a shower hose on this unit. Uh, if you do have a outside grill or cooktop, the gas line will be down below on the frame. Uh, typically close by and it is just a quick connect but when you have it connected it does have a shutoff valve as well so you want it in the on position when you're using it so gas can come out but when you are done make sure to have it off and then the plug inside to make sure debris doesn't get in there. Uh, if you come across a vent like this on the outside all this is is a vent to your refrigerator. All your controls are going to be on the inside of the RV. I uh, really don't have to get back here for much just periodically and once twice a year just to make sure everything still looks okay. Um, clean out any cobwebs, you know, check for bees nests, stuff like that. Um, these lids are vented. Never tape those off or close them up. They're vented on purpose to release the heat built up inside of the refrigerator. On um, standard RV fridge, they do work off 120 volt being plugged into an outlet. Or if you're dry camping, you can use the battery power uh, to ignite the igniter to operate it on gas. Um, again, all your controls are going to be on the inside. Um, behind the box here, there is a fuse. So if you do have an issue with the fridge not turning on, you do want to remove this cover and check the fuse. Uh, but the most important thing about the, these refrigerators is they do feed off of gravity. So you do want the RV to be as level as possible when operating it. You don't want to be on a steep incline and try to operate the fridge. It can damage the cooling unit. Um, so you just want to be cautious with it. Just, as long as it's comfortable enough to walk in and camp in, comfortable enough to operate the fridge um, but, but again all your controls are going to be on the inside and I'll show you that in a little bit also out here this is the furnace exhaust um, when operating the furnace make sure nothing's leaned up against it you don't want any chairs or tables or anything pushed up against there because it's just going to be blowing out hot air this is your water heater all Jayco's are going to come with that with water heaters uh, they're aluminum tanks um, again, your controls are going to be on the inside. Uh, and this particular model works on electric and gas. Um, all Whitehawks and J Feathers are going to have the electric and gas operations. Some of the smaller units, you might only have gas. Um, you'll tell them, I'll show you on the inside how to check the switches. They do have a drain plug, it's a 15 16 socket. It's just a plastic drain plug, it goes in underneath. All of this will be set up for you uh, when you buy it. From us through April, April and October. Right now, it's still winterized; just haven't cleared it out yet. Um, but once it's set up, it's good to go. It'll fill up with water. Uh, you do always want to make sure water is in it before you ever turn it on. Good way to check is your pressure temperature valve up here. If you're to pull this tab up, water comes out. You know the water level is up to the top and it's full. Right now, if you pull that, nothing's coming out. It's empty. So you want to make sure to fill it up with water. So when they are empty, just connect. To your water source, turn on the water and open up a hot faucet inside. You know, it'll be hissing out air for a little bit. Once solid water is coming out, you know the hot tank is full as well. Um, electric only works if you're plugged into an outlet. 
Uh, and again, if you're dry camping, you can use it on gas operation. And it has direct spark ignition in here, so you don't have to come out here and light anything. It's just a switch on the inside you flip on. What's nice about these uh, tanks from uh, Atwood and Dometic is that they can actually be operated on uh, both electric and gas at the same time for faster recovery. So if you're using a lot of hot water, people are taking back-to-back -back showers, you can flip them both on to recover it. It's about 20 minutes and it'll be ready to go again. Um, electric operation takes about an hour to heat up and gas is about a half hour. But again, both of them at the same time, it's about 20 minutes. Um, just for maintenance, it's a good idea to check your burner tube for any kind of cobwebs, bugs, stuff like that. That's the most common issue we see is blockages inside this tube. Uh, if you have compressed air, it's not a bad idea to blow air through there periodically just to make sure nothing's built up inside. All of these models are going to be coming equipped with the electric awnings. You just have a switch inside to be able to extend and retract it. Um, and as you can see right now, we're not even able to take it out all the way because of the building. And that's okay with these electric awnings. You know, if you only want them out a few feet, that's fine. If you want them fully extended, that's great as well. Um, but they don't have to be all the way out or all the way in to be able to use them. And they do have a pitch adjustment on these, on the Solera ones anyway, to where you just pull it down to be able to adjust the pitch. It'll stay in position and add a little tilt to one side or the other. So if it's raining out, you don't want water to be pulling up on top, you can have it run off one side or the other just by adjusting the pitch. Uh, it's just real important before you do run the awning back in that you position it a little bit higher. It doesn't have to be perfect because um, it will straighten itself out once you get in. You just don't want it to have a sharp 90 degree angle to try to go in. You can damage the system. Pull it up a little bit uh, before we run it in. Uh, another important thing with the awnings is high winds. Um, anything above like 20 mile an hour winds, you want to be real cautious with. Make sure to take it in. Uh, if you're leaving the campsite for the day, you're out exploring, keep an eye on the weather. Make sure you know storms aren't going to be coming in later that day. Um, you just want to be very careful with it because it is essentially just a big sail hanging off the side of your camper. And these are just aluminum channels. So please just be cautious having it out all the time. So this is going to be your monitoring panel and your main control center. Uh, you'll have the switches to operate things uh, like your awning, extend and retract, your slide out, extend and retract, um, and some light switches, awning light, outside security light, your living room lights. And the red switches are going to be some of your appliances. You'll have a water heater on electric, water heater on gas. Um, you can have one on. Like I said before, you can actually have both on uh, if you want faster recovery times. And when they're on, you just leave the switch on and the water heater will turn on and off to maintain the temperature. Uh, the water pump, if you're using your water from your potable water holding tank, turn that on, it'll turn on your water pump. Once pressure gets built up, the pump will shut off automatically and just as you use uh, faucets, it'll turn on and off to maintain the pressure. Up here is your indicator lights um, for your holding tanks. Uh, again, black tank is going to be your toilet tank. Press the button down, it'll read empty. So nothing's in it right now. So as you use it, it will go up, you know, one third, two thirds, and then full. Um, so once it gets close to being full, that's want to make sure to empty it soon. Gray one, that's going to be your sink and your shower. Uh, some RVs do come equipped with an additional gray tank. This one only has one, so right now this button doesn't do anything. But if you did have two gray tanks, you would have another button for that as well. Uh, fresh tank will be your potable water holding tank. Um, with that one, you will fill it up, and as you use it, it will be depleting down to empty. The last one is for your battery. That goes off the lower chart here, the L, F, G, and C. It's low, fair, good, charged. So right now, we're only hooked up to the battery, so it's actually a pretty low battery. It's going to be empty. But as you can see, you know our lights still work. Uh, things still can't operate a little bit. A lot of times if you turn off stuff, it'll go up a little bit because it's reading the voltage. So right now I turned off the main ceiling lights, but now it says the battery is in fair condition. So if I turn off more lights, it might even go up to good. So the more you use it, the more it'll go down. Um, but you still can operate things typically if it's in fair and low. You just want to make sure to charge the battery again soon. On this particular model, it does have a fireplace installed. But because of the amp draw of the fireplace being so high, you can't operate the fireplace and the water heater on electric at the same time. So there's a selector switch. Um, not all of them are the same. Some of them even have either fireplace or air conditioner. If you have a 50 amp system, you only have this. And these you typically find on the 30 amp rated systems. Um, but if you want to use your fireplace, 
you won't be able to use your water heater on electric. You'll have to use gas to use your water heater. And all you do is just select the switch. And again, that's just for electric operation only. So I'll show you how to ignite your stovetop. Uh, there are some different models out there, so each one's going to be a little different. This one does have the igniter. Uh, typically, if you have um, five knobs up here, the left one will be your igniter. It just sends a spark to each one of your stovetop burners. So you can set one to the flame setting and you'll be able to ignite it. You can light one at a time. You can light all three at the same time if you wanted to. Um, it does send a spark to each one. On these newer Furion models, they do send a spark now to the oven underneath to where you can be able to light the pilot light. And you do that by setting the oven knob to the flame and holding that in as you turn this until the flame lights inside. Once the flame lights, you can then set it to the temperature to, to turn it on and off to maintain that temperature. Whenever you are done, just make sure that the knob is set to off. And you close everything up. The refrigerator. On these Dometics, the controls are going to be inside of the freezer door. Uh, it has a simple operation, just an on and off switch. And it has a selector switch once it's on. On auto mode, it goes off your main power source. So if you're plugged into electric, you'll be on AC, but right now we're not plugged in, so it's gonna automatically switch to gas. Uh, the reason for the auto mode is to help preserve your food in case of a power loss at the campground. If you're plugged into AC, if somebody unplugs your cord or the power goes out at the campground, it will automatically switch to gas to keep it running for you. Um, you can have it just, if it's not on auto, it'll be on gas only. Um, the reason they give you that is so if you are plugged in, you can still test it to make sure it does light periodically. Um, and only really after you change out your propane tanks do you want to make sure to check it to make sure it still lights on gas just to purge out any air that might be in the system. I always recommend switch, switching it back to auto. And if we were plugged in, it would go to AC. And the right side is just going to be your temperature changes. One's going to be cold, five is going to be your coldest setting. Thermostats, uh, these new Dometic ones, they are just touch sensitive, they aren't click buttons, so you want to be cautious when tapping these, you don't want to be pushing them in too hard. Uh, real small in the bottom right corner will say off when it is off. Tap it once, will go to your fan settings. You have auto, high, and low. On auto mode, when you're using the air conditioner, uh, you set it to the temperature and the whole system will turn on and off to maintain the temperature inside. If you were to have the fan set to either high or low and then you went to select your AC it'll tell you the fan speed in the middle what will happen is a uh, fan will kick on uh, and the compressor but the compressor will turn on and off to maintain the temperature but the fan will run at all times either on high or low and that's just to keep good air circulation going through but if you wanted the whole system to shut down while operating the air conditioner you want to make sure to set that to auto and also when you select the furnace be able to turn on and off the furnace you want to make sure that the uh, fan is set to auto as well because if you actually have the fan set to low or high and then you select your furnace what will happen is your AC fan will kick on whatever speed you have set and the furnace will kick on um, they say they do that for air circulation when running the furnace uh, but really just having the furnace do its job on its own works perfectly fine as well now the furnace can operate off of your battery and propane. Uh, you don't have to be plugged into an outlet to be able to run your furnace. Your air conditioner and your fan uh, does have to run off of shore power being plugged into an outlet. You can't run those off of your battery. But the furnace you can operate if you were out dry camping. So your entertainment setup, uh, you do, most of them come equipped with TVs. Um, some others just have a spot for it. The TVs always have a way to come off this one. Uh, has two straps you do have to pull it down to be able to pull the TV out and lift it off so they do have other connections where you can add other features like video game systems DVD players blu-ray players things like that uh, if you do have the Furion uh, radio system this is a DVD player and it is already hooked up to your TV as well so you just have to set the TV to the HDMI setting to be able to play DVDs through here through your TV and it will also come through your speakers as well um, so with these CD players, you know, CD, DVD, they do have Bluetooth, you can stream music through it, it has USB import, auxiliary import, uh, it also has a headphone jack as well. 
Um, typically around the TV area, um, sometimes it can be behind the TV or in compartments, you will see a coax connected to a little box, and that is a selector switch. Uh, because you do have an antenna on the roof to be able to pull in air channels, but if you're hooked up to cable at the campground, you do want that switch to be set to cable. Uh, typically now they do say antenna and cable. If it's just a standard switch with a green light, if the green light is on, it's antenna. If the green light is off, it is cable. The radio will work off a 12 volt battery, but the TV does have to be plugged into shore power to be able to operate the TV. Most units, you do get two zones of speakers. You'll have zone one and zone two. Zone one will be your inside speakers. Zone two will be your outside speakers. So you can have one set on or you can have both. Um, and again, if you are playing a DVD through here, it will be coming through your speakers of the RV as well, not just the TV. Uh, fireplace. This will only work if you're plugged into uh, shore power and an outlet. It will not work off your battery. Um, it does have a power button to be able to turn it on. You can actually change the color of the flames and also adjust the temperature. And it has a sleep timer as well. Where if you only want it to run for like two hours and then turn off, um, you can set that. Uh, these are great uh, for heating up uh, the camper. Uh, if you're camping in really cold weather, you know, if it's like 40 degrees outside, you might want to be using your furnace. Um, but just on cool nights, be able to take off the chill and you don't want to waste any propane, these electric uh, fireplaces do work really well. Um, but again, you just want to be careful because uh, they do pull a lot of amperage. Uh, so if you're using a lot of other things, you want to be careful using this uh, so you don't trip any breakers. Just to go over a few safety things, every RV is going to be coming equipped with a fire extinguisher, uh, which is BC rated, so it's rated for liquid and electrical, it's not rated for trash fires. And you also have a carbon monoxide detector, and they can be located in multiple points throughout the RV, um, typically around the dining room table. They, uh, those are hardwired in, so as long as you have power to the RV, whether it's battery or plugged into an outlet, they will function properly. Uh, the only thing you would have to change batteries in would be your smoke detector. Uh, those are going to be on the ceiling. Those are just like a household one with a 9-volt battery. And then also during travel, you just want to make sure everything's buttoned up nice and tight. Um, everyone's going to have something a little different. But when you have loose chairs, there's going to be a way to strap it down. Either a strap underneath, something going around the side. Like this ottoman here. It's also a bench. It does have a strap to hold it in place. Just want to make sure everything's good and buttoned up. Uh, your shower doors do have a handle. Keep them closed during travel. And all your roof vents. Yeah, you might, something you might not pay attention to when you're camping is when you have your roof vent open. Because when you're done camping, you want to make sure it is closed when you travel. Uh, with that being open, wind can kind of shoot by and actually take off the lid sometimes. So let's make sure it's nice and tight when it's closed or uh, for travel. Uh, and all your other doors too, uh, like your, if you have a cover on your stove top and make sure that is down for travel so it's not banging around and all your doors are shut and your windows as well. A lot of the RVs now are coming equipped with LCI's one control. Um, it's also now Jayco has called it J command. Um, and what this is, it's actually an app for your phone to where you can operate everything on your control panel from your phone, from running your awning, your slide out, and your lights, um, sometimes even temperature control. Uh, and to log into that, they have a way to download the app on here. Once you have the app on your phone, you do need to scan this little sticker here, the QR code. That's your login. It's got your username and password right on there. The sticker is typically going to be around your control center. Um, lately they have been putting the sticker above the kitchen sink. but It's just a very tiny sticker, but you do need to find that sticker to be able to log in onto the app uh, through your J command. Not all RVs are coming to cook with that, um, but many of them are today, so make sure to ask your salesperson if you do have that. If you do have that, make sure to locate your sticker. For your slide out operation, uh, it is very important that your slide out is either all the way out or all the way in uh, while using it or for travel. Just, just make sure it has a good seal when it's all the way out or all the way in so water, debris, stuff like that isn't getting inside. Um, when you are extending or retracting the slide out, when it is fully extended on these through frame 
systems, you will hear the clutch engage to let you know it is fully extended. So right now we'll extend it out. And once it's fully seated into place, you'll hear a loud noise. And that clicking noise is your clutch engaging. That does let you know it is fully extended. It'll also make that noise when it's coming in as well. So you always want to make sure you hear that um, coming in or out and let you know the slide is all the way in or out. Some of the other systems uh, might have the in-wall slides. Uh, those you'll just hold down the button until they come to a stop. They won't make the noise, but they will just eventually come to a stop and won't run anymore. So either way, you just kind of run the room in or out until they stop. If you need to manually retract these types of systems, those are from underneath the unit. Attached to the motor, there'll be a nut on there to be able to use a ratchet to be able to run in and out. You want to check your owner's manual. It'll give you a nice step-by-step -step, uh, pictorial on how to manually operate your slide. So here behind this panel is your water pump. These are going to be in different locations on every single RV. Uh, typically they are near the kitchen sink, uh, around the kitchen sink, or close to where your fresh tank fill is. Um, the water pump, when it's in summer use, will be pointed towards your uh, line going to your fresh water tank. So when you turn on the pump, it will suck from your tank and go to your system. Jayco is really great about installing a bypass kit and a siphon hose to be able to winterize it yourself straight from the water pump. And what you do is actually you want to gain access to your water heater first. This one just happens to be on the back side of the pump. Um, if you can't find your water heater from the inside, you want to go outside and locate the black box where your water heater is. And it will give you a good starting point to where to look on the inside because again they're different on every single RV. Um, this one just happens to be right by the water pump. Um, on the valves on your hot water tank, there are a couple different setups, so you want to look. For this one, when it's going in line with the water line, it actually just makes a loop going all the way back to your hot line. So that's the winterized position. What it's doing is just bypassing the hot water tank when you're adding antifreeze in. So after you clear your water lines, on this type of system, you do want to point the valves going towards your tank at the top and the bottom. So now when cold water comes in, it'll go into your tank, fill up, and come out as hot. When you want to winterize, you put them going opposite direction of the tank. So when you pump antifreeze in, it'll now bypass the tank and go to your hot lines. So after you've bypassed it, you can take your siphon hose, turn your siphon hose on, put this in your jug of antifreeze, and you turn on your water pump, and it'll suck antifreeze into the system. And you go to each faucet one at a time, open it up until antifreeze is coming out. Once antifreeze is in all your water lines and your spigots, then your unit is winterized. And lastly, just some maintenance things. Um, you know, when your tires, they do have bearings in them. Uh, the main, uh, owner's manual will actually tell you, you know, every 12,000 miles or once a year to get them repacked. That is a great thing to keep up on, uh, prevent any kind of damage to the bearings. So you want to make sure to keep an eye on that. You know, if you're doing a lot of cross-country trips, you know, you're going to be putting on more than 12,000 miles a year on it. Make sure to get them repacked every 12,000 miles. Uh, if you don't keep track of your miles, kind of do more local trips, stuff like that, once a year is fine. Uh, on the exterior, everything on the outside is going to uh, have some sealing around it. All your marker lights have some sealing. Uh, just keep an eye on that. Make sure nothing's breaking open, deteriorating. And most importantly, the roof. Everything installed on the roof is going to be screwed down, and there's going to be some sealant going around there to prevent water from getting into those screws. Just from UV rays, travel, time, um, you will get some cracks starting to form on the sealant. Maybe you had a tree branch, scrape it, peel it back a little bit. It's a good idea to get up there a couple times a year, at least twice, uh, just to inspect the sealant. Make sure there's no openings, gaps, um, nothing in the roof membrane peeling up. Just want to make sure it's good sealed uh, to prevent any kind of leaks or damage to the system.